꾸준한 영어 테드쌤입니다. 오늘도 낭독을 하기 전 우리 꼭지와 함께 아름다운 명시 한편 감상하고 낭독에 들어가 보도록 하겠습니다. 꼭지 나오기 좋죠? 이제 처음에는 제 손바닥 위에 딱 올라왔었는데 지금은 제 손바닥을 넘어서고 있습니다. 영어 잘할 것 같아요. <웃음> 체스처처럼 네, 어릴 때부터 문학에 노출되어 있는 아이입니다. 자, 파블로 누르다의 시는 영리 시선 중에서도 굉장히 많이 사랑받는 시 순위에 올라오는 시들이고요. 실제로 읽어봐도 굉장히 서정적이고 음, 강한 에너지를 가지고 있으면서 해석하기에 따라서 어, 다양한 해석이 가능한 그런 시들인 것 같습니다. 이번에도 사랑에 대한 시이지만 또 한편으로 여러가지 생각을 할수 있도록 만들어주는 시인 것 같아서 제 입장에서는 굉장히 좋았습니다. 한번 읽어보도록 하겠습니다. I do not love you except because I love you. I do not love you except because I love you. I go from loving to not loving. From waiting to not waiting for you, my heart moves from cold to fire. I love you only because it's you the one I love. I hate you deeply and hating you, bent to you, and the measure of my changing love for you is that I do not see you but love. You blindly. Maybe January light will consume my heart with its cool way, stealing my key to true calm. In this part of the story, I am the one who dies, the only one, and I will die of love because I love you. Because I love you, love in fire and blood by Pablo Neruda. Oh, oh, 굉장히 와닿습니다. 네, 자 이제 낭독에 들어가 보도록 하겠습니다. 어. 바로 읽어보도록 하겠습니다. Chapter 2 Music in the Night I feel at like this time there are a few things you should know about Chester. He is not your ordinary cat. But then I'm not your ordinary dog. Since an ordinary dog, he wouldn't be writing this book, would he? Chester came into the house several years ago as a birthday gift for Mr. Monroe. Along with two volumes of G.K. Chesterton, hence the name Chester, and the first edition of Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities, as a result of this introduction to literature, and even the fact that Mr. Mono is an English professor, Chester developed a taste of reading early in life. I, on the other hand, have developed a taste for books. I found Jonathan Livingston Seagull particularly delicious. From Chester's kittenhood on, Mr. Munner has used him as a sounding board for all his student lectures. If Chester does fall asleep when Mr. Munner is talking, the lecture can be counted a success. Every night, when the family is sleeping, Chester goes to the bookshelf, selects his midnight reading, and calls up on his favorite chair. He especially likes mystery stories and the tales of horror and the supernatural. As a result, he has developed a very vivid imagination. 
I'm telling you this because I think it's important for you to know something of Chester's background before I related to you the story of the event following the arrival of Bonicula into our home. Let me begin with that first tonight. It seems that after I went to sleep, Chester, still stewing over the lost milk, sat down with his latest book and attempted to ignore the rumbling in his stomach. The room was dark and quiet. This did not prevent his reading. Of course, since as you know, cats can see in the dark, a shaft of moonlight fell across the rabbit cage and spilled onto the floor below. The wind and the rain had stopped and, as Chatter read Edgar Allan Poe's The Fall of the House of Usher, he became increasingly aware of the eerie stillness that had taken their place. As Chatter tells it, he suddenly felt compelled to look at the rabbit. I don't know what came over me, he said to me the next morning, but a cold chill ran down my spine. The little bunny had begun to move for the first time since he had been put in his cage. He lifted his tiny nose and inhaled deeply, as if gathering sustenance from the moonlight. He slicked his ears back close to his body, and for the first time, Chester said, I noticed the mercurial marking on his forehead, what had seemed an ordinary black spot between his ears took on a strange V-shape, which connected with the big black patch that covered his back and each side of his neck. It looked as if he was wearing a coat, though no, more like a cape than a coat. Through the silence had drifted the strains of remote and exotic music. I could have sworn it was a gypsy violin, Chester told me. I thought perhaps a caravan was passing by, so I ran to the window. I remembered my brother telling me something about caravans, my mother telling me something about caravans when I was a puppy, but for the life of me, I couldn't remember what. What a caravan? I asked, feeling a little stupid. A caravan is a band of gypsies traveling through the forest in their wagons, Chester answered. Ah, oh, yes. It was come back to me now. Station wagons? No, curved wagons. The gypsies travel all through the land, setting up camps around great bonfires, doing massacre tricks, and sometimes, if you cross their palms with a piece of silver, they will tell your fortune. You mean if I gave them a fork, they'd tell my fortune? I asked breathlessly. Chester looked at me with disdain. Save your silverware, he said. It wasn't a caravan after all. I was disappointed. What was it? I asked. Chester explained that when he looked out the window, he saw Professor Wickerwine, our next door neighbor, playing the violin in his living room. He listened for a few, min few moments to the haunting melody and sighed with relief. I've really got to stop reading these horror stories late at night, he thought. It's beginning to affect my mind. He yawned and turned to go back to his chair and get some sleep. As he turned, however, he was startled by what he saw. There in the moonlight, as the music filtered through the air, sat the bunny, his eyes intense and staring, an unearthly aura about them. Now this is the part you won't believe, Chester said to me, but as I watched, his lips parted in a hideous smile, and where a rabbit's bucket is should have been, the little pointed fangs glistened. I wasn't sure what to make of Chester's story, but the way he told it, he sent my hair on end. Chapter 3 Some Unusual Goings On The next few days passed uneventfully. I was very bored. I was new for a while both. Slept all day, and the Chester, whose curiosity had been aroused by the strange behavior of the rabbit that first night, had decided to stay awake every night to observe him. Therefore, he too spent most of his days sleeping, so I had no one to talk to. The evening weren't much better. Toby and Pete, who used to play with me as soon as they got home from school, now ran immediately to that silly rabbit's cage. Play with it, or at least they'd try to. 
but Nikola did not make the most energetic playmate. It took him quite a while to wake up each night, and then when he did awaken, he didn't do much except hop around, in, around the living room. He didn't play catch, he didn't fetch, he didn't roll over to get his tummy rubbed. I couldn't understand why they played with him at all. I accept it was because he was new and different, but I was confident that they would soon tire of him and just come back to trusty old Harold. Finally, on the morning of the first day, I caught Chester bleary-eyed over the water dish. He grumbled at me in a most unpleasant manner. You know, Chester, you were never exactly charming in the morning. Lately, you've become downright grumpy. Chester growled in response. What are you doing this for anyway? What are you looking for? He's just a cute little bunny. Cute little bunny? Chester Ch oh, yeah. Chester was amazed at my character analysis. That's what you think. He's a danger to his household and everyone in it. Oh, Chester, I said with an indulgent smile. I think your reading has gone to your head. It's just because I do read that I know what I'm talking about. Well, what are you talking about? I still don't understand. I'm not sure yet, but I know there's something funny about that rabbit. That's why I have to keep around. But look at you! You're exhausted! You sleep all the time! How can you call that a rot? I am awake when it's important. He sleeps all day, so I sleep all day. So just what have you seen since that first night that makes you uneasy? Well, said Chester, I, uh, that is... At this point, Chester started to face his tail which is a cat's way of changing the subject, he finds it uncomfortable. He then stumbled sleepily into the living room, so I asked again. Following him, what have you seen? Nothing, he snapped, and proceeded to curl up on his chair to go to sleep. After a moment, he opened one eye, but that doesn't mean there's nothing to see. For the next few mornings, it was the same routine. I'd be ready for a good romp around the living room, and the chatter would go to sleep. Pete and Toby were at school, Mr. Murner was at the university, he never did too much romping around anyway. And Mrs. Murner was at her office. No one to play with a poor, neglected Harold. At first I thought I could strike up a friendship with a Branicula and make hit him a few tricks, but I could never wake him up. Wake him up. He was always waking up just about sunset when I wanted to take a snooze. A rabbit, I concluded, is cute to look at, but is generally useless, especially as a companion to dogs. So I would retire each day with my favorite shoe to the rag and chew. Now some people, especially Mr. and Mrs. Mono, can't understand my taste for shoes and yell at me for snacking on them. But I always say there's no accounting for taste. For instance, I remember one evening when Mr. Morner picked some of his sour balls out of the bowl by his chair and dropped a green one on the floor. He didn't notice as it rolled across the room and landed near my nose. I decided this was a perfect opportunity to try one for myself. I placed it in my mouth and wished immediately that I had it. As the tears started running out of my eyes, I thought, what's wrong with my mouth? It's running, it's turning inside out. Mr. Murno immediately noticed that something had happened. What's the matter, Harold? Are you looking for someone to kiss, Harold? Help. I wanted to cry. But all that come, all that came out was an ooh song. I ooh for days. So how can anyone who likes green sour balls criticize me for preparing, preparing a nice penny roper or a bathroom sleeper? But back to the matter at back to the matter at hand. One morning, Chester had news. Dead bunny, he whispered to me across our food bowls. Food bowls. Got out of his cage last night. Don't be ridiculous. I said, how could he break through that wire? Look how little, how little he is. That's just it. He didn't break through any wire. He got out of his case without breaking anything or opening any doors. 
I looked puzzled, so Chester told me the following story. Now, Harold, he said, I don't want you thinking I'm not a good watched cat, but after a few hours late last night, I grew curious about the time. I went into the hallway, and you know the, you know that new clock they've got, the big one that goes all the way to the ceiling? Well, see, it has this thing in the middle called a pendulum. At first, I figured I would just leave it alone. It looked like that spool they tied on a string and hung from the doorknob for me to play with it when I was a kitten. Every time I hit that silly spool with my paw, it would swing back and hit me on the nose. I hated the toy, so naturally, when I saw this one, I decided not to have anything to do with it. I checked the time it was midnight. I was all set to go back to the living room when something stopped me. Curiosity? I ventured. I suppose you could call it that. I prepared to think of it as the challenge of the unknown. I put one paw over my nose and reached out with the other one and gave it one good smack. I darn near broke my arm. It's still tender. So how sweet it is. He showed me his little paw. I couldn't see anything wrong. But I knew better than to argue with it. Oh yes, I said, that looks terrible. You must be suffering awfully. You better go east today. He limped dramatically, just far enough to display his new handicap and continued. I couldn't even get to the pendulum. Somebody had put glass in front of it, and I was pretty mad. I was all set to go back, and at the same time, I couldn't help watching the time move back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It was so easy to watch, and before I knew what had happened, I was waking up. I fell asleep? I asked, incredulously. I couldn't help it. I didn't even know it had happened, but I looked up at the face of the clock, and it was 12.45. I'd been gone for 45 minutes. I ran back into the living room, looked at Bernicola's case, and it was empty. I couldn't imagine where he was. Then I noticed a light coming from under the kitchen door. I went into a crouch, starting the light went click. I heard the refrigerator door close, and the light went out. It must have been Mr. Morton having his midnight snack. I suggested. No, that's what I thought. I jumped on my chair, called up real kick, and kept one eye open, pretending to be asleep. Slowly, the door to the kitchen squeaked open. The little head poked out from around the corner and I looked to either side to see if the coast was clear. Then, guess who came bouncing out all by myself? <coughs> all by himself. And with that idiotic grin of his plastered all over his face. Well, I guess it wasn't Mr. Monroe, I said. Not unless he wears the bunny pajamas and gets very tiny at night. Bunny pajamas, huh? You got it. Unfortunately, I hadn't positioned myself so that I could see him get back into the cage, and I didn't want to let him know that I had seen anything, so I had to stay put. I still don't know how he got out or back in. At this point, Mr. Warner came downstairs to make breakfast. I wondered if Chester had dreamed the full thing. He didn't admit he'd fallen asleep. <coughs> and, as I've said, he has quite an imagination. <coughs> but I was game, after all. There hadn't been any excitement in this place for days. Chester and I took our positions under the kitchen table. We didn't have, we didn't have long to wait. Holy cow, Mr. Warner yelled as he opened the refrigerator door. He took his funny-looking white thing out of, the, out of the fridge and held it at arm's length. Peter, come down, uh, come down here. What is that? I whispered. It's me, Chester answered. It looks like a white tomato. Very funny, I said as Pete came into the kitchen. Pete, have you been playing with your chemistry set in here? No, Dad, why? I thought that this might be one of your experiments. Do you know what it is? Z, Dad, it looks like a white tomato. Just then, Mrs. Munner and Toby came in the door. What's all the fuss about? Mrs. Munner asked. We were just trying to figure out what this is. Toby pulled it down so he could get a better look. Well, he said, it looks to me like a tomato, white tomato. 
Mr. Mr. Morneau took a good long look. You know, he said to his wife, it really does look like a white tomato. There's one way to find out, said Mrs. Morneau, who always was the practical one. Let's cut it open and see what is what's inside. Everybody gathered around the table. I jumped up on a chair, and in all the excitement, no one noticed that I had my paws on the table, which under normal circumstances was discouraged. To say the least, Chester wasn't so lucky. Chester, get off the table. Mrs. Mona said Chester jumped onto Toby's shoulders, where he stayed to view the proceeding. Mrs. Mona took her sharpest knife and cut cleanly through the thing. It fell into two halves. It's a tomato, all right, said Mrs. Mona. Here are the she, here are the seeds. But it's all white, Toby observed. And look, said Pete, it's dry. So it is. 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 Mr. Mona said as he picked up one of the halves. There is no juice at all. Well, and what do you think? It's gonna bad, I guess. Though I've never heard of a tomato turning white before. Come on, she said, clearing the table. Let's throw it out and have breakfast. And Harold, get your paws off the table. Right. Chester jumped down from Toby's shoulders and motioned for me to follow him into the living room. This had better be important. I said, they are cooking bacon. A white tomato, very significant, Chester murmured. So it's a white tomato, I said, that's my way back to the kitchen door. What does that have to do with the vernacular? I can tell you one thing, Chester said. I got a good look at the tomato. There were very suspicious marks on the skin. So, I believe they are test marks. So, so tonight, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna reread a book I read last year. How fascinating, I said, as the aroma of frying bacon wafted across my nostrils. And what book might that be? Mark of the Vampire. What? I stopped dead in my tracks. Meet me tonight after the others have gone to sleep. You'd better take a nap today so you can stay awake. Chet closed his eyes. I shifted my look to Bonicula, who seemed to be asleep in this cage. A tiny smile sat upon his lips. A happy dream? I wondered, or something else? I reverie, my reverie was broken by the sound of crunching bacon. I was in the kitchen in a flash. <laughs>